We don't go out very much, I want you to know, that um, I answered um, the professor's letter to me, which came a year ago, and this is probably one of the rare occasions that I have left the monastery. So you'll have to um, live with me in my wonder as I look out and observe you. And he was right. I would love to talk to each one of you individually because um, we are um, a community. Um, well, anyway, let me get on to the talk. And, uh, <laughs> and maybe that will clarify a little bit about where I come from. And um, I think um, you will understand something about Regina Laudis and why I'm here. My few words to you today are entitled, Jesus the Actor. And practically speaking, this is really directed to you, the person of Christ, to each one of you, the person of Christ, the person who lives within you seeking to find the act that, hello? <laughs> Did I lose you? <laughs> I think I lost you. Well, that is, t I won't, ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> that is the person who lives within you. Ah. Uh, <laughs> seeking to find truthful and what is freeing in your lives. If we are open to the love of God, a love that is significant, truthful, and freeing in your life. Can you still hear me? <laughs> All right. We are open to a love that, through the love of God that we share with one another, then we will discover who we really are. And we will discover that we are a much deeper, stronger, loving, and a more remarkable creature than we are typically led to believe. This is what the patron and founder of the Benedictine monasticism called, in the prologue, the rule of Saint Benedict, the expansion of the heart that is the fruit of religious life. This is what I would like to speak about this afternoon or this evening. What I would like to share with you tonight, it is, where are we? <laughs> my own understanding of my experience in this, ex this spiritual expansion over my years as a member of a monastic community and how my life as a professional actress came into relationship and has become expanded and transformed by the traditions of Benedictine life. Specifically, I'm going to talk about my vocation as an actress and how that has been realized, paradoxically, through the development of a theater at my monastery. Now, I say paradoxically because, obviously, a cloistered monastery is not the conventional place that one goes to realize one's potential as an actress. <laughs> Conventionally, one could argue that if you want to be an actress, the last place that you should go <laughs> is a monastery. And yet, in my case, my vocation as an actress could only have reached its fullest expression by allowing that vocation to be refined through a monastic way of life. But first, maybe a little bit about the monastery. The Abbey of Regina Laudis, which is in Bethlehem, Connecticut, oh, about two and a half hours from here by plane, 
was founded in 1947 by Reverend Mother Benedict Duss, of whom I will have more to say later. She was trained as a surgeon at the Sorbonne and then entered the Abbey of Notre Dame du Joire in France. And during the war, as an American citizen, she lived for a time underground in the Abbey to avoid the attention of the Gestapo, who would have arrested her if they had known that an American was living in the community. It so happened that the monastery of Jouar was liberated by the American forces. Thank you, thank you. Judith is my assistant. She always knows what I need. <laughs> The monastery at Jouar was liberated by the American forces of the Third Army under General George S. Patton, which had a powerful influence on Reverend Mother Benedict in terms of her future vocation. After the war, Mother Benedict felt impelled to make a return to the country of her origin in gratitude for the contribution of the United States that they had made to the liberation of Europe. She actually went to the tower after the, the war was over. She saw the, 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 the um, tank, tank come roaring through the streets and she saw the star and the flag of the Americans. And she was so moved, she had been sick down in, in, the, in the bottom where the, the, all the people were. She was so moved that she ran down and asked that a rose be sent to, to the first American soldier so he would know that there was an American living there. And she said, promise him that I'm coming back to America. She felt that it was her mission to found a monastery in the United States and in 1946, she and a companion arrived by ship in New York, where they were met by a friend and brought to Bethlehem, Connecticut to get their bearings and sort out where they were going to go. She had $20 in her pocket at that point. Reverend Mother Benedict did not have plans to stay in Bethlehem, but through one thing and another, and the generosity of benefactors, she did. And a small community developed. Soon, a local landowner, Robert Leather, gave Mother Benedict about 30 acres of his most precious land on a hill overlooking the Berkshires. Mr. Leather wanted to preserve his land from development and most importantly, he wanted his land used for the praise of God, and we're still doing that to this day. The Abbey has 38 nuns, 30, 40, we just got two new ones. <laughs> and it is enclosed in the Order of Benedictines. We observe the rule of Saint Benedict quite formally. For one thing, we continue as a community to chant the divine office seven times a day and once in the middle of the night, as most of our liturgies. We have 400 acres in Bethlehem and a large and varied assortment of farms and workshops in keeping with St. Benedict's dictum that our lives should be a balanced combination of prayer and work aura et labora. We have a dairy farm. We make our own cheese, thanks to Mother Noella. For our own sustenance, we make this cheese, and we have a beef herd, as well as pigs, sheep, and a llama to look after our sheep. <laughs> and we have a donkey to look after another herd. 
We have extensive orchards, apples, pears, peaches, grapes, and so on, as well as a large vegetable garden. We try to be as self-sufficient as possible. We also have a blacksmith shop, a carpentry shop, and among our community, we have weavers and artists and craftspeople who maintain our facilities, who provide much of what we need, and we also ask for interns who want to come and spend an, a year with us to try out their efforts to see if they would like to join or if they would like to just learn a little bit about the monastery. All of this is very consistent with the spirit of the rule of St. Benedict. And there are many Benedictine abbeys that could be described in much the same way. But one thing in which we are distinct is that we have a theater. <laughs> and we have had one for almost 40 years. One that keeps growing and getting better all the time. The growth of the theater is to me an illustration of the principle put forward by Saint Luke, that we should first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if we do so, the things we really need to become fully and authentically ourselves will be added unto you. Because when I first entered the Abbey, Believe me, I, be I thought I was losing the theater forever. And instead, I entered the Abbey only to be given a bigger and deeper, a much deeper appreciation for life-affirming power of the theater than I could ever have imagined before I entered. Well, let me begin by telling you a little bit about how I came to the Abbey. Can you all still hear me? Oh, good, all right. Let me begin by telling you about my father. He was an actor who played small parts in the movies. And my uncle, who was the singer and actor Mario Lanza. And my parents separated and I grew up with my grandparents in Chicago, where my grandfather was a projectionist in a movie theater. I would go to the movies and sit in the booth with him and wake him up when it was time to change the reels. <laughs> and I got a quarter for every, every time I did this. And I watched the movies. I never heard the sound because he was sleeping. <laughs> but I watched the movies, and I learned a lot about making movies that way. In fact, the first movie I made, they told me, where did you study? You do it so well. And I said, I don't know. I just got it on. And then years later, I had this dream, and my grandfather came to me and said, you brat, you never gave me any. <laughs> Mm. That's the way we are, isn't it? We... I guess you could say that there was never a time that I didn't imagine myself being in the movies. Since the movies were kind of a f the family business, so fortunately, when I was 11, I was moved to Southern California to live with my mother and her new husband because she remarried. And so I went to California and to go to school there. And I was in high school and then in college. And when in college, I played the role of St. Joan. And a talent scout saw me in the, in the role of St. Joan. And the talent scout, a friend of mine, sent my picture to Paramount and Hal Wallace. And they sent me a note when I was in school and said, you have a request to come to be in, I can't even remember, it shocks me still, to get a screen test at Paramount. So I got this call from Hal Wallace, 
who was looking for an actress to act with a young man named Elvis Presley in the second movie. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> Literally, I'd been in a Catholic girls' college. I was studying something else. I didn't know this young man at all. So when I went in to meet him, I said, how do you do? And he said, how do you do, Mr. Doris? And we got on famously because I just thought he was a very gentle, sweet young man. So I went back to school and they said, did you meet him? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> He said, well, did you get a lock of his hair or do something? I said, you're absurd. He said, Elvis, did you, did you touch him? Did you take anything? Did you? I said, you girls are really, you are the... <laughs> so, anyway, we got on famously. We really did. And I want you to know, he is a good kisser. <laughs> Forty prop men were watching, so we didn't get on to, you know, it wasn't a big famous thing, but, but you know, I was 19 and he was 21, what are you going to do with 40 men watching you? <laughs> one of them with a, with a toothbrush painting you and the other one powdering you and the other one saying, oh, you're blushing. <laughs> anyway, anyway. I did play with Elvis in his second movie, my first movie in 1957. It was called Loving You. People often ask me what Elvis was like, and I'll say now that he was a lovely person, very honest and open and truthful, and I liked him. I liked him very much. And I made another film with Elvis called King Creole, and my career was launched. I made several movies after that, including Where the Boys Are in 1960 and Francis of Assisi in 1961, where I played St. Clair, as well as a little-known film called Lisa in 1962, which incidentally was the story of a Dutch Holocaust survivor trying to make her way into Palestine. A role that had a profound effect on me in terms of my vocation. It was very, very difficult for me as a 21-year-old girl to get the idea in my head that I was going to play the part of a woman who had been really, she was a, um, a girl who had been in Auschwitz and she had been used as a scientific experiment by the Gestapo. How to do this as an actress was a very, very difficult assignment, and one that was amazingly difficult in terms of my own spirit as an actress, how to understand what a woman might feel like in that. What helped me most was meeting a young woman who had been in Auschwitz. And Suzanne told me, she said, you know, the most terrible thing that I remember was when the Gestapo first entered my house. And I had long black braids. And one of them came up to me and grabbed my braid and took his knife out, and just cut it off and put it in his pocket and turned to me and said, you Jew bitch, you don't need a braid. She said, that destroyed, destroyed me because I loved my hair. And I thought, that's every woman. Every woman loves her hair. That's her golden, that's her tribute. That's, that's the sign of her life. And, and I understood something of how to approach that role I never expected to. 
And I understood something about actors, how you must understand the inside of your character. It doesn't matter how you learn to do this and this and sit down. And do. I mean, all of those things are very important, very important. But somewhere, you've got to find the soul of your character before you can do it anything worthwhile. Anyway, that was also very important in terms of my vocation because it was really a time in which I began to really understand what the need of redemption was because who, who was going to answer those people? Where were you going to find an answer for the millions of people that were buried under that? Who was going to, how was that going to be answered? It was only in God was the redemption of something like that ever going to be possible. And I think the contemplative life began to form in me a sense of truth. But anyway, getting back to the process, it was in 1958 that I first came to the Abbey. I was in a Broadway production of The Pleasure of His Company with Cyril Richard, Cornelia Otis Skinner, Charlie Ruggles, for some of you who remember, and George Papard, you remember him. And I was tired and exhausted, and a friend of mine suggested that I take a break and go to New York for a while and go to the Abbey for a retreat. I suppose a question about a vocation had always been in the back of my mind. And from the first moment that I came to the Abbey, I felt that I belonged there in some way. In 1959, I met with Reverend Mother Benedict Duss, and I asked her, do you think I might have a vocation here? Am I material to enter the monastery? And she said, no, Dolores. <laughs> you go back to Hollywood and return to your career. And she said, I think, go, go and come back and, and you can come back and have a visit. I was so relieved. <laughs> I, I, I got out of there so fast. <laughs> I went back to Hollywood saying, I don't have to deal with this thing. I can just be an actress and forget it. And I did for three years, but it never went away. I became engaged to a man named Don Robinson. And one night he asked me if I really loved him. And I did. But he knew there was something else that was holding me back from fully wanting to get married. And I knew there was something in me that stood in the way of making that commitment. And that something with my life wasn't quite right. But he came out with it and he said, Dolores, would you go to that monastery and see what's bothering you? And in fact, I made arrangements the next day. The next available flight to Connecticut, I went back. And I met with Reverend Mother Benedict again and I told her my story. And I asked her what I should do. And she said, Dolores, what do you want to do? And I said, Lady Abbas, I want to do God's will. I really want to be an actress. I want to go back to Hollywood, and I want to marry Don Robinson, and I want to make movies. But I want to know what God's will is. And Lady Abbas said, I didn't ask you about God's will. God very well knows his own will. <laughs> She was some person, let me tell you. <laughs> I asked you about your will, and I don't want to know about God's will anymore. He has an absolute, absolute grasp of his own will, and I'm sure he understands what he wills. What I want to know is what your will is. And I said, I want to go back to California, but I really want to know what God's will is. Well, we, we went around for an hour. <laughs> Lady Abbas finally got up and walked out. <laughs> she said, forget it. 
So I went to meet with Mother Placid, who was my dear friend there, my contact person at the time, and still is a member of the community. And I said, well, I guess I'm going back to California. And Mother Placid said, really? I just spoke to Lady Abbas, and she said that what you really want to do is enter the monastery. <laughs> I said, did I say that? <laughs> and she said, well, that's what Lady Abbas said. Do you want me to go and tell her no? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 that's exactly what I want. That's exactly it, Mother. That's exactly right. So I entered in 1963, and I've been there ever since. <laughs> Naturally, I thought I had to put the theater and acting behind me forever, and that I was going to live this life of quiet contemplation. But at that time at the Abbey, there was a Jesuit from Wisconsin province named Francis Prokes, who was acting as an architectural consultant. He said to me that very first week that I entered, Dolores, how are you going to be an actress in the monastery? And I said, Father, will you stop that? I have given that up, and I am here for God alone. And he said, that's nuts. <laughs> you are here as an actress, and you better figure out how you are going to be an actress in here, or you're never going to make it. Well, I wanted to cry and run out of the room I did not want to hear any more about acting or films or the theater, and it was a long time before what he was saying made any sense to me. It wasn't until we started a theater on the Abbey land that I really could see how I could help young people find their vocation in Christ through the medium of the theater. What we have found and what we see every year as a new play comes into being. Is that by going through this experience of being an actor and being truthful in your part as an actor? The actors who work on our stage get a glimpse of their deeper vocation because to be an actor, a good actor, is to be centered and grounded in your own truth and in your own body, and to engage with others who are also grounded in their own truth. <coughs> Acting is relational. It is about listening and about submitting to the truth of the actor playing across from you. And so you can see what a wonderful medium of self-exploration and self-discovery the, the theater can be. And of course, this truth that we find in our part in the theater is always rooted in what it means to be a creature of God. But that was a long way off. The theater at the Abbey didn't come into existence because I had some kind of plan that I wanted to put into motion. It happened as almost every true thing always happens, true in Benedictine life, because other people had a special vocation as well. These people came into relationship with my vocation. And it is the synergy created by the love between us all and our mutual love for the theater that brought our theater into being. Not long after I entered the monastery, the actor James Douglas, you remember him in, the, in the TV, and his wife Dawn, who had been friends of mine in Hollywood, they basically just dropped their careers and moved to Connecticut to follow me in my vocation. James Douglas continued to work as an actor in New York and lived near the Abbey, and he would help out in any way that he could. At the time that at the Abbey, we had an annual fair where we invited the people of the surrounding towns to come, where we sold our jam and our cheese and took kids on hay rides and did that sort of thing. And James he suggested 
that we do a little play at the summer theater, at the summer fair. And so in 1975, James, a few others from the Abbey, presented a little play in a tent on the lawn of one of our guest houses. And it was very successful. So the next year, the group came together again and did a play about Noah's Ark. The next year, we did another play again, and so on. A tradition began of presenting very modest little plays outdoors every summer in a tent. Now, what really tipped the scales was when the actress Patricia Neal came to the Abbey. You may remember her for roles in Breakfast at Tiffany's and Hud, for which she won an Oscar. And she played across from our late friend Paul Newman in 1980. She had had a stroke and other problems in her life. She actually entered the Abbey by virtue of our very creative abbess who said when she was divorced and in terrible trouble, you come here and be a postulant for a month. <laughs> Patricia said, what are you talking about? <laughs> Me. <laughs> so they put the habit of a postulant on her. She was wonderful. She was great at dusting. <laughs> <laughs> she was a very wonderful and humble postulant. After a while, she was ready to go back to her life, but she wasn't sure if she could ever go on stage again. So we suggested to Patricia, that she do a little performance at the Abbey. Specifically, it was suggested that she do a reading from the autobiography of Helen Keller. She loved Helen Keller. To see if she could handle being in front of the public again. Patricia had this terrible stroke, and so she didn't speak that clearly, and she walked with a terrible limp. So she was very, very embarrassed to be in front of people. But she was wonderful. Everybody loved her. She could have just stood there and gone, mmm, 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 and she, everybody would have just loved seeing her. <laughs> but anyway, she did a performance during the fair that summer in the tent. And I remember she was in the tent reading, and there was a terrible thunderstorm. And everybody went flying out of the tent into their cars, but her reading was excellent. And afterwards, I asked Patricia, if she thought how it went. And she said, I think it was wonderful, which is very much like Patricia. A very dear friend of mine who passed away recently, but she added, Patricia said, I don't want to do anything like that in the rain again. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you want to do? Let's build a theater. I said, what? I said, a theater, a theater. I want a theater, a real theater. <laughs> so we set an outdoor theater with a roof and open sides. And I thought, this is wonderful. And I said, well, what would you call it? And she said, the Gary, after Gary Cooper, whom I loved. That was my real love. <laughs> and I thought, oh, the Abbas will love this. <laughs> <laughs> and Olivia, after the child that she had who died. Well, Mother Abbas thought it was wonderful. She said, when you love someone, that is the test of your life for eternity. She said, I don't care what happened, she put it before Christ. She loved him and she paid for it. God bless her. We can name the theater whatever she wants. She didn't have the money to do it, but she asked all of her friends to contribute. <laughs> Give me some money. <laughs> so that's how the Gary the Delivery was born. With Patricia's inspiration and the help of some benefactors, we built an open-air theater on the grounds. 
1986, and the theater is named Kivikgeri the Olivia. In later years, we added wings and developed the dressing rooms and so on. The theater sits about 200 people and is quite beautiful. Open to the backwoods, and our property is so the trees and birds and often insects are always the feature of the theatrical world that is created on the stage. It's wonderful when you do a, 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 anything from Hamlet or so on, and you've got the woods is the background. It's a great theater for Shakespeare. Over the theater, we have seen many plays. A company of actors formed around James and Don Douglas called the Act Association. And that company continues. Among the plays we have done include As You Like It, Romeo and Juliet, The Miracle Worker, Light Up the Sky, it goes on and on. In recent years, we have tried ambitious musical projects, My Fair Lady, The Music Man, Fiddler on the Roof, and last year, Oklahoma, and I think we're going to do South Pacific this summer. <laughs> Members of our community have also produced other more experimental and edgier drama works, like Chekhov, Jean-Paul Sartre's No Exit. That one was a tricky one to get on with us. If you're not <laughs> familiar with No Exit, it's a story of three people who are stranded together in a room in hell for all eternity and they have to learn to get on with one another. Well, on the straight, I would say on the surface, it may seem like a strange play for a Benedictine Abbey to endorse, but when you consider it on a deeper level, you can appreciate that Paul says, well, as such, he has a great deal to say about what life and community is like. <laughs> So that's the origin of our theater. Having said all that, what makes our theater a Benedictine Abbey? Or a Benedictine theater? In what way isn't it just a theater company that happens to perform at a monastery? How are we doing a time? Are you all bored, ready to go? Because I don't want to <laughs> okay. I think the place to begin to answer this question is by saying a bit more about what characterizes Benedictine spirituality in particularly the spirituality that has emerged and evolved at the Abbey of Regina Laudis. It has always been characteristic of the Benedictine contemplative orientation that we are continually challenged to become aware of the work of God and the Holy Spirit in his creation. If you have cows and sheep and orchards and pigs and chickens, and working with them in your hands is central to your spiritual practice, you eventually become acutely aware of how God is present in all created things because we are always face to face with the cycle of birth and death, of decay and renewal. One way of putting this is to say that the profound mystery we are always re-encountering in our contemplative life is the mystery of the incarnation. The theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote a multi-volume work entitled Theodrama, in which he explored the body of Catholic thinking and the doctrine through the prism of drama. One of the things he points out that I think is quite a wonderful insight is that the one way in which Christianity is unique as a body of religious thought is that in Christianity, God enters the world as an actor. Jesus comes to us as an actor. Through his incarnation as Christ, God becomes fully human. And then as Christ, he moves into the world as a dramatic actor. He makes things happen. He changes things. He affects things through dramatic actions, by engaging with people, by forming special relationships in love with other people that become the foundation of the community of the church. And von Balthasar goes further when he points out 
that the great strength of the theater is that it always, by its very nature, holds to the existential truth that we are all of us called to act, and that we act with our bodies and through our bodies. I was really taken by an Italian monk who came to visit us recently. He came for a short visit, and during one of his homilies, he was marveling at the mystery of the Incarnation and was imagining Mary holding Christ in her arms on Christmas morning. He put it this way, here is this baby. It has my nose. It has my eyes and my chin. And yet, he's God. And yet he has my mouth. <laughs> and he has my eyebrows. How is it possible? this incredible union of God and man in Christ. We must always be brought to marvel at the incarnation in fresh ways. And I would suggest that the theater is the art form that most fully offers us that opportunity because it is the presentation of one body to another in the present, it is always alive. It is always a living moment of gift. And the actor gives of himself, herself, through their body, just as God enters the world and expresses himself through the gift of his body. As Benedictines, we take three vows the vow of stability, the vow of conversion of life, and the vow of obedience. I want to talk briefly about how our theater has been shaped by the tra traditional Benedictine vows. First, as I mentioned earlier, Our theater began when a couple of actors from Los Angeles decided to drop everything and move out to Connecticut to keep me company. They became committed in stability to the monastery out of our relationship. In time, other actors came to the monastery and joined them. Soon, young people from all over the world and country were dropping everything to move out to Connecticut to see what we were up to. So you see, the theater could never have come into being without having at its heart a community to stability, people committed to living side by side together in one place. On one piece of land, the theater's stability is what has allowed it to grow and change from being a few wet actors in a tent to presenting highly choreographed and developed musicals at a very high level of professionalism. The principle of stability is simply an organic principle. You put a seed into the ground and you nurture it and it will grow. It will not grow if you keep uprooting it and starting it someplace else. Many of the young people who have come to the Abbey originally to take part in the theater have continued to relate to the Abbey by taking on other commitments and by becoming engaged in other works in the Abbey. They help us with the haying in the summer or they work in the blacksmith shop or they sing in our lay choir they have gone on to make commitments to other professions. And in fact, quite a few have gone on to enter our monastic community and to take monastic vows. In other words, 
the theater has served for so many people who relate to the monastery as a first step towards a deeper, more committed, and more fruitful life. The willingness to grow and change and be open to a greater commitment of love is what we mean by conversion of life. Benedictines, as we are Benedictines, we take this vow of conversion of life in stability so that we will always have before us the willingness to change and adapt to what God asks of us and always be willing to see the operation of grace in the challenges that we are faced with. This is only possible when you have stability as a point of reference. When you aren't running from one play to the next play, or from one part to the next part, or from one relationship to the next relationship. Stability is what makes conversion of life, as opposed to just a change of scenery possible. And then, the hardest one for me, obedience. <laughs> That's the one that people seem to have the hardest time with too. And yet obedience is basically a simple principle, however hard it may be to submit to at times. Anyone who has been in a play can tell you that to pull it off means you have to submit to a lot of demands. You have to submit to a director. You have to submit to the demands of your role. <laughs> Maybe you wanted a better role. Maybe you think you should have been cast as Hamlet and not Horatio <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> if the play is going to work, you have to learn your part and let others do their part as well. In other words, a play is a structure that demands a loving obedience in order for it to come together. When everyone working on a play submits in loving obedience to what is needed, then something comes to life that is greater than the sum of its parts. What is born is a community, the community of the play, a living play. Each play that comes to life at Regina Laudis is a thriving organism and is a transitional community. It may only exist for the summer, but for so many people, the play is the first deep experience of community life. And their experience in the theater prepares them to take part as actors in other communities and to take on bigger commitments in obedience. I would be remiss if I did not add that there is a Benedictine tradition that we receive all visitors as Christ and that we have, we, we, we have um, an obligation to provide hospitality to all who come to us. The plays that we produce at the Abbey are one of the ways in which we express our hospitality. People from all over can come to our land for an afternoon or an evening and sit at our theater, which I have to say is very beautiful on a summer night with hanging baskets and lanterns lighting the way and partake for a while in our world and share with us because our theater is a reflection of our spirituality. And each play is nurtured within the context of the monastery and informed by the principles that govern our life. And then there is something of our monastic spirit that goes out through the bodies of the actors and touches our audiences in ways that never fail to be profound and wonderful. I do think our theater touches our audiences in a dimension that is truly unique and holy in the best sense of the word. In conclusion, the theater has grown to a point where we at the Abbey are ready to make the next step. 
it is clear to us that if we really want to provide young people with the kind of experience they need, we need to be able to offer programs that exist beyond the summer. We will need, for instance, to build an all-weather performance and rehearsal space that can go on throughout the year. We also need to provide a school so that we can teach young actors the skills that they need, dancing and voice and so on, so they can best express who they are as actors. These are all dreams in my head. And we have more pressing challenges as well. Most of our community and our common spaces have been housed for 60 years in the wooden building that used to be a brass polish factory. Well, our old building has been condemned by the fire marshal. At least the third floor is where many of us live in order to address the critical issues of fire safety, accessibility, insufficient living space, and so on, and deteriorating structures and all that jazz. We have launched the New Horizons project, which we hope to complete within the next five to 10 years. In short, it will mean constructing fire egress staircase for our third floor dormitory and an elevator there's a whole detailed schedule of what needs to happen, and we are busy writing grants at the moment in order to start the first phase of the project. I'm so glad that I'm with you. <clears throat> I'm not there listening to all the hammering. <laughs> Quite how we're going to make all this happen, I don't have a clue. But I know from our experience to date that the spirit always finds a way to provide for what we need in order for our hearts to expand and grow. The history of our theater is a testament to this truth. And I look forward with anticipation and wonder. And a certain amount of what I hope is creative impatience to what is going to happen next. But I want to return as I finish to the prologue of the rule of St. Benedict. He begins by asking all of us, to listen, ascolta, to incline our hearts to what God is asking of us, to submit our lives in loving obedience toward what we know how to be the right way of life, and to live truthfully and walk without blemish. And this is very difficult to do. In fact, at the beginning of one's religious life, so much of what is asked is impossible to do. But the Saint Benedict offers us hope in the prologue. He notes that there will be times when what God asks of us, what our religious superiors asks of us, may seem impossible to submit to. But he addresses this saying, let us ask the Lord that he supply the help of his grace, what is impossible by nature. We cannot foresee and what I could not foresee when I entered the Abbey of Regina Laus is who we really are called to become. You can't imagine as a young actress full of desires and expectations and limitations that one day if you give yourself over to what God is calling from the deep within you, that you will become in effect an entirely new kind of person a person with a larger heart, whose capacity to give and receive love, whose capacity to be patient, will grow beyond what you can imagine. This is what I would suggest to you, is the essence of Christian hope. Christ lives in us, and to the degree that we let Christ live and grow and expand in us, so will our lives expand. So be full of richness and joy and humor and wonder, far beyond what you could have asked for. And to that, I would simply also add to you that I have been working with my dear friend, Richard Denute, for about eight years on a book of memoirs about my life in the Abbey. And I hope that that will be available to you 
in the next year. And that will go into more detail about all the rustiness of what I've talked to you about the Abbey. And I don't know where we're going to be published or how, so that I will give you note on. But if you're interested in anything further, I hope you will have another 600 pages of it. <laughs> but for tonight, I want to thank you very much for listening to me and for sharing all of this. It's been a great joy to be with you and to have your ear. The ear of your heart has been most beautiful and the most wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you.